Kirabanim, distinguished guests, guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my immense privilege and pleasure to introduce our guest of honour for this evening, Lord Pickles. He has had an extremely busy and distinguished career to date. He served on Bradford Council from 1979 to 1992, and his activities there included sharing social services and the education departments. He then served as a Member of Parliament for Brentwood and Ongar from 1992 until 2017. He held a number of posts while in opposition, including that of Chairman of the Conservative Party. Once in government, he served as the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government and also served as a Minister for Faith. He was made a Privy Councillor in 2010, a Knight Bachelor in 2015, and a Peer of the Realm in 2018. Kanai Nahara. <laughs> he currently serves as a Lord Parliamentary Chairman of the Conservative Friends of Israel, and also as a UK Government Special Envoy for post-Holocaust issues, a position he has held since 2015. Throughout his career, Lord Pickles has been a great friend to the Jewish community and a passionate advocate for the State of Israel. We are all delighted that he has agreed to be with us tonight. I have been fortunate to hear him on several occasions, most recently, just a few weeks ago, at a Yom HaShah event in Edgware. He has a wonderful talent of combining interesting facts, perceptive observations, and a sense of humour, all delivered in an endearing, broad northern accent. <laughs> Interviewing him for us this evening is Richard Ferrer, the editor of the Jewish News. We are delighted to welcome Richard and thank him for supporting us this evening and for agreeing to conduct this interview. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite Lord Pickles and Richard Ferrer, both of them, onto the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here in conversation with uh, Lord Pickles, or as I affectionately like to call you, Eric. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes or so, uh, we'll keep it familiar. Um, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, uh, MP for um, Ongar and Brentwood for 25 years. It's hardly Finchley and Golders Green, not a Jewish constituency as such. What was it that um, sparked your passion to be such a, an advocate for the Jewish community? Well, Brentwood Olga is, is not a Jewish community by any stretch of the imagination. I used to be able to say I could have invited every single one of my Jewish constituents round for afternoon tea and I would not have run out of crockery or a, <laughs> uh, or, or a silverware. Um, no, uh, I think we did have a count of, I think there were 20 at one time. Um, throughout the whole constituency of, of 75,000. Actually, I came uh, uh, to be uh, an admirer, if you like, of uh, the Jewish community via Israel. I went to Israel first uh, in 1980, and I just love the place. I love the people, I love the attitude, I just, you know, it's a democracy, um, believes in freedom of the press. It's the only country in the uh, Near East where you can confidently sue the government and win. Uh, <laughs> it's the only place, if you're gay, you could go to a gay nightclub and be confident not to be thrown out of a window afterwards. It is a, a place where governments change by democracy. It's a place where even prime ministers can be charged with criminal offences. And, that and often are, yes. Yeah? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm sure he's innocent. Um, <laughs> where, pri where presidents are thrown in jail. It is a wonderful country. It believes in freedom. It is a bastion of, uh, of democracy and a, and a bastion of enterprise. And by Jove, it's changed. 
uh, in that period. When I went there, it was primarily a, an agricultural place. Uh, lots of or the oranges are still there, of course, but uh, now it's high tech, it's innovation, and it's uh, an outward cooperation. If there is a disaster anywhere in the world, and the first people to send is the Israeli government. So I, I came through that, and then, of course, you know, you start attending um, Friends of Israel events. It's inevitable you bump into the odd Jewish person there. It's, an, it's inevitable you start to make friends. You know, it's rather nice to look out. I see one or two chums in the audience. So, I mean, it's good. And in a way, I'm probably talking too much, but if you, if you, if you kind of just kind of nail I know Port Teresa's not had the happiest of weeks, but I went with her uh, to the Board of Deputies after Charlie Edborn, and I was pleased to hold up a sign to say, I am a Jew in various languages. And she said, in fact, to tell you the truth, actually, now she's about to step down. I said it first, and then she copied me, but that's another story. <laughs> so, the Jewish identity is a fundamental part of the British identity. And if you took away the Jewish identity, if we arrived at a, a time like perhaps it has occasionally been in France where people want to leave, we would be the lesser place for it. And it can't always be about politics and about votes. It's got to be about what's right. We'll, we'll, we'll come... Yeah. We'll, we'll touch on the, on the challenges the Jewish community in this country have faced, and I'm sure they're very different now as they were 25 years ago um, you know, in your first few years as, as, as an MP. Um, I, I would like to go into the subject of the last few days, the tumultuous events, um, as we stand here with uh, Theresa May just days away from standing down as Prime Minister. Um, you're going to have to answer the next question with a name. Um, <laughs> who'd you fancy? For what? <laughs> Prime Minister? Well, there are so many people standing, I haven't actually had time to learn all their names yet. <laughs> um, let me give you kind of a, in, uh, an insight uh, into uh, the Tory party elections. The only people that matter really are the MPs, and they pick the last two. And it's the secret of the last two is bumping everybody out until you have somebody that no one is going to vote for and some of the, the, the parliamentary party. Now, uh, God bless him, Ken Clark fulfilled that role for a number of years, so if anybody but Ken would be, um, would be elected. Uh, so, uh, so I haven't worked out who the Ken Clark of the 9, 10, 11, 12 that are standing currently are. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what transpires. You're not going to give me a name. <laughs> who, who do you think? How long have I been in politics? I've been in politics 50 years. Am I good at not answering a question? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> And to, and, to misquote, and to misquote P.G. Woodhouse, wild horses out on their bended knees at their most silver tongues would not persuade me to tell you. <laughs> but by all means, ask again. Who do you fancy for Prime Minister? A Conservative. Okay. Um, Theresa May's three years um, will, of course, be remembered uh, for the Brexit quagmire that we're still deep in. Um, what have their achievements been? Well, you, you've got to understand from a Conservative perspective, I'm not being rude, um, she was the Prime Minister that lost her as an overall majority, the first one we've had in 25 years. And uh, she's been there and achieved our lowest vote historically, so it's, it's natural that those are things that will dominate her legacy. But if I was to point out two things, First, I think uh, she has made uh, the acceptability of mental illness inside the National Health Service, uh, put it onto a stronger basis, but we're gonna have to see how that develops. But, uh, but the second thing is, and I think we should be all um, amazingly grateful for this, she has a very strong commitment to Israel and a very strong commitment to anti-Semitism. And uh, when I came back from Romania with the IRA declaration still wet on a piece of paper, she was the first one to accept it. And we adopted it 
um, uh, two weeks after IRA adopted that definition. And I'm pleased to say we picked Israel by 10 days, so we're the first to do it. And I think in terms of long-term effect, the IRA uh, definition is going to have a very persuasive change um, in the psychological makeup of this country uh, because it is a working definition, it's about getting into the police training, it's about getting it into the Office of Public Prosecution, into educational establishment, it will make a difference. And it's only like a month ago that France accepted it. I have to say, getting France to accept the IRA definition is uh, an enormous achievement. I was with a bunch of folks uh, from the States. For us, the IRA definition is, is immensely important state by state because we want to get it into education and a number of things that the state controls. So it will make a big difference. So I think in terms of the, uh, the social change in Britain, her acceptance of that, her pushing of that, her general openness of that will make a big difference. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to return to the uh, subject of IRA maybe a little bit later. Um, just to return to Brexit, um, not wishing to bore anyone in the room too drastically. Is there any prospect of the new Prime Minister getting a deal through the House of Commons? Well, I, uh, I mean, I wanted to, uh, her to have another chance. I, I, I wrote a piece so, a while ago because my concern is we've now lost four Conservative Prime Ministers to, uh, to Europe and I have a nasty feeling that we could well lose the next one to Europe. Uh, because there is uh, a need to do something which is now becoming very unfashionable in politics called compromise. Now, my view is that um, we should leave and we should leave in as orderly a way as we could do. And I don't require a perfect Brexit. I don't require a squeaky clean Brexit. But what I, I think is important is for us to be able to get on to the most important thing, which is the trade deals. And we need to negotiate a trade deal between ourselves and our largest partner, um, and likely to be our largest partner for a long time. But you can't get to an agreement by ambush. You can't get to a, an agreement by trickery. You can't get to uh, uh, an agreement by just sheer persistence. You need to take people along with you. So, would it be fair to say that in recent days and, and weeks you have reluctantly come to the conclusion that a second referendum might be the, uh, the way to go? I, to tell you, I suggested this, but people kind of misunderstood. I wasn't saying, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to do that? I'm saying this, I, and I'll make it absolutely clear, I am sick to death of the House of Commons. I am sick to death of members of Parliament voting against everything and not voting for something. And if they can't come to a ruddy decision, then send it to a bunch of people who can. And it was in that kind of context, uh, I was saying, not in a, a kind of a people's uh, a vote uh, kind of context. Uh, the risk of being controversial, I have held this view for a long time. I believe that we will leave the European community without a deal by accident. I don't think anybody will intend it. And I think we might find ourselves in a situation where Europe just says, well, okay, no extension, goodbye. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think we should go out in an orderly manner. And I think we should realize that perfection isn't everything. You know, it's, it's politics. We've got to get on with it. We've got to sell things. We've got to work things. We've got to give business some degree of stability. We've got to give our kids some degree of stability. Striving, those people striving, we should do something about that. That's important. But Brexit has just sucked the energy out of everything. And I've just finished that enormously long biography of Lyndon Johnson, the four volume thing. I started in March and I finished it now. I finished it just the day before Brexit. Um, so, you know, um, what Johnson said, was this, if you're going to survive in politics, if you're any good in politics, you've got to be able to count. You've got to be able to count divisions. You've got to be able to count support. And just standing there and doing nothing about getting those votes, it, it's not leadership. Um, <clears throat> voters have, have given both parties a, a, a really good kicking in, in recent weeks with the local elections and uh, more recently the European. Um, 
it, it must have been quite difficult for you as former Secretary of State for Communities and, and local government to see the Tories' local government base annihilated yep. in recent <laughs> days. How do, they, how do they return? It's still the largest, the Conservatives are still the largest party. Uh, but I can remember oof, going back into the mid 90s when we were very unpopular and seeing these kind of numbers disappear. Uh, I, think we, I think I saw us lose slightly over 3,500 councillors. And what people need to understand, if you're not involved in politics, the council by and large uh, has a spouse. And if they're really exceptionally charismatic, they probably also have a friend. And they were probably coming in uh, and help, but you, you lose your counsellor, you lose uh, the spouse, you lose the friend, you lose your infrastructure. So they're going to have to rebuild, they're going to have to start again. So yes, I am more than irritated uh, uh, um, by that because I was part of that process of, of rebuilding and I've always had a, a passion for local community and local politics. And... A lot of people were just sort of wiped out through no real fault of their own. Admittedly, four years ago they uh, were elected, uh, but not, really, not very much on what they had done anyway, because it was a national swing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's not a good, because quite a lot of services come through local councils. Mm. I mean, I was in banging on the doors of, um, of Barnet last year, because I felt it was really important uh, to ensure that Labour didn't win that seat. Staying uh, broadly on the subject of Brexit, and I promise we will leave that subject uh, in, the, in the next question, uh, how worried should we be about the, the rise in populism uh, in Britain and across Europe? Well, um, I haven't really properly um, examined the uh, results um, across the board in Europe. I've looked very carefully at what happened in, in Poland, which I thought was quite interesting. I don't think we saw the rise or the dominance of populism, what we might have done there. And um, what seems to have happened is there does seem to be an rouse of, of Greens and, and Liberals. I mean, it, it does exist. I've been obviously very much involved in what's been happening um, uh, in Poland. Uh, uh, I saw to Barbara just before we started about compensation and, uh, and, uh, and land rights and all that kind of thing there. I've been very much involved uh, uh, in Auschwitz uh, and... Uh, some of the problems we've seen there, I was very much involved in the, 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 the defamation law and the pullback that we saw there, and also in Hungary. Um, so I, I don't think the kind of populism that we're seeing here uh, is anything like what's happening in, uh, on the continent, but it's undoubtedly that the, the sheer nastiness of basic nationalistic anti-Semitism is stalking Europe. Um, and the opposition party, which uh, is a, a convenient segue. Over on the other side of the house, we have Jeremy Corbyn about to take on his third Tory Prime Minister uh, in the next few months. How, how do you get a handle on, on uh, where the Labour Party currently finds itself? There's the um, Equalities Watchdog only today uh, announcing an unprecedented investigation into the Labour Party. I think only the BNP uh, the only other party that have actually been investigated in this way. Um, can you give us a, a sense of, of what might be happening uh, in, in the Labour ranks and, and what we might have to fear? It, it, it is shameful. Yeah, it is very sad. And I'm not saying that in any, you know, sort of any sense of irony. Um, my family um, uh, were Labour supporters. My great-grandfather helped form the independent Labour Party at the turn of the last century. Um, I have a great deal of affection for the Labour Party. The Labour Party is a great party. But the Labour Party has disappeared. It's gone. It's gone. The only remnants of the Labour Party are a few MPs left. Um, we, we saw what uh, six weeks ago Corbyn took control of the London Labour Party. We've seen the deselections taking place uh, with regard to Assembly members. It's all going to be changed. And pretty soon uh, those uh, moderate Labour MPs will go. Now, what's its importance? Well, the best way I can really describe it is not from my words, but um, uh, uh, Rabbi Sachs. We had a debate in the Lords, and it's one of these things that was time limited. You can only speak for two minutes. And within 45 seconds, uh, Lord Sachs had nailed it. And he said there were basically three problems. 
uh, with anti-Semitism. By the way, it's irritating to follow somebody like that because he said it and he got oh, damn. Um, <laughs> he, he, said, he said this, that anti-Semitism is a problem in any country when it moves from the fringes to a mainstream political party. The second problem is when it doesn't really affect that party's electability. And the third problem was when people who pointed this out were shouted down. And, we, and we've seen that. I mean, they even monstered Jonathan Sachs on, on, the, uh, on Twitter, which was a, a shocker. And if to kind of segue, what do, you, do I think the chances are of a Corbyn government? I think the chances of a Corbyn government by Christmas has considerably improved uh, in, in a bad way. Uh, in the last few days. The Tory party would have to have lost their marbles to, to push uh, the accelerator on a general election. Um, I don't think, um, I think I have difficulty. They already have. I, I, yeah, I, I have difficulty with has. <laughs> um, okay, this is how it might happen. I don't say it's going to happen, this is how it might happen. Well, we get a leader who says we're going to have a no deal. Now, Parliament's expressed a view about a no deal, but the only way you can stop a no deal is by pieces of legislation. Uh, so that's not, there's no real time to be able to do that. Um, you could stop it by uh, revocation of Article 50, but only the government can move that because it's secondary legislation. So if there are sufficient numbers, and it wouldn't take very many, to say we absolutely refuse to let you go without an ordeal, the only way you can stop it will be by a vote of confidence. If there was a vote of confidence and say a number of uh, Tory MPs voted for it and decided to bring the whole house of cars down, then I think then you have the possibility of a general election that nobody wants. That's what I talk about leaving by accident. Um, if, if that was to happen, what I think the last few days has shown is the Labour Party vote is more resilient than the Conservative vote is. So I could see uh, a Brexit party and Conservative party sort of fighting itself out to the death and Labour slipping through the middle. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm not saying this is the most likely way that it's going to happen. I don't actually think that it's going to, I personally don't think that's happened. But the possibility of it's happened has increased over the last few days. Uh, the, the Jewish press, um, including the Jewish News, got into uh, got some stick last year for calling a, a, the Labour Party an existential threat. Um, do you see the Labour Party as an existential threat to the Jewish community? Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, uh, Corbyn has had plenty of time to realise that the party is rhythm with anti-Semitism. All this delay in removing them isn't, uh, you know, it's not about, you know, them not being able to, to get their act together. After all, they've just removed Alistair Campbell, who on Thursday voted uh, for the um, Liberal Democrats and told the world on a Saturday that he'd done so. I know for a bank holiday win uh, a weekend, uh, he was removed. Now, they've either learned how to get rid of people really quickly, and they're going to, over the next week, remove all they're anti-Semitic members, and if they had that kind of thing, everything could be sorted by next Friday. But I just don't think that's going to happen. I'll ask you a, a difficult question that I get asked a lot. Is, is Jeremy Corbyn an anti-Semite? I don't know whether D Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite, because I'm not entirely sure what the laws of libel are uh, on that. <laughs> but what I do know is that uh, Jeremy Corbyn facilitates anti-Semitism. Yeah, the he's, on, he's allowed it to, to, to flourish inside the Labour Party, and it's because of his basic belief. His basic belief is uh, that uh, the, the people are obstructed uh, by the system, uh, by the pillars, and he sees various pillars existing, uh, the, the, the stock exchange, the law, and parliament, and he sees Jewish people have been part of that establishment, and he, that's why he wants to, he wants to uh, remove decision making to the conference. That's why he wants to increase taxation on the very wealthy, not because he thinks it's going to actually bring in much money, but because it's about 
destroying the wealthy. So would a Corbyn government be a threat to um, funding of faith schools, uh, security of our schools, uh, Shekhita, um bilateral relations with Israel? Uh, I mean, what, what sort of threat are we facing here? Don't you mean Palestine? <laughs> Um, yes, I, I think there will be a kind of a leveling and a leveling down. And I think you, it's not just uh, Jewish faith schools that, uh, that um, Corbyn's opposed to, it's all faith schools. You, you see that reasonably, it's the Church of England, it's the Catholics as well. Um, and I think that the... One thing that we're being proud of under Blair and under Brown and under Cameron and under, and under May is that we have funded security to make our citizens feel safer. Um, now, whether that will continue, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you expertly danced around the, the direct question of who do you want to be the uh, next Tory leader. So I'll, I'll reframe it. Which Tory leader would be best qualified to counter the threat of Corbyn? Which is basically, who do you want for the next Tory leader? <laughs> I know. I, I, kind of, I kind of understand that. And um, I think that's me when we get down to the last two. And, um, uh, but so far, I mean, one of the things I will be doing is I will be approaching all the leadership uh, contenders for a, a statement one on Holocaust remembrance, two on anti-Semitism, and three on the relationship with, um, with Israel. So far as I am aware, all the currently declared um, candidates that I know of, and I've been away from a radio for two hours, so <laughs> there, there, there may have been more, are, um, uh, are what you would describe as friendly towards Israel and, uh, and uh, very friendly towards the Jewish community. Okay, on the subject of, of Holocaust remembrance, um, and a subject close to your heart, the Westminster Memorial, uh, where are we currently um, in terms of the revised design plans um, and uh, the estimated time that that, that will be erected? We're, we're on schedule, and uh, we're, um, we're on budget. Um, we're waiting for Westminster Council to decide. I think there's a massive amount of evidence that would suggest uh, that this is of national importance <clears throat> and we expect uh, uh, Westminster, as I'm sure they will not treat it like it's a dormer window. Um, there's been a quite organised uh, campaign against it uh, from people from all over the world who don't like the ideas of, um, of, of, um, uh, of uh, a, a memorial so close to, uh, to Parliament. But its location is the point if I'm being really blunt with you. It's right next to where all the major decisions were taken about the Holocaust, um, either in Parliament or in Downing Street or in the Great War Ministries. And it's the Holocaust essentially shaped the last half of the, of the last century and it still has a great uh, clawing effect. And I want people uh, to leave that uh, memorial, looking towards uh, Parliament and seeing Parliament as the, um, the, the as the bastion against tyranny, but I also want people to work there who look out on the monument to say, "Look, we've got a choice. We can either oppress the people, or we can, uh, or we can protect them." And, can you understand the reservations of people like Baroness Deitch who yeah, say that it's, it's money that shouldn't be spent and we, we should be putting more money into the Imperial War Museum? Uh, yeah, of course. I, I, I've worked very closely with Baroness Deitch for years on anti-Semitism in, um, uh, in universities and I've worked with her very closely on, on, on Poland. But she's wrong. She says that she doesn't like the design. Fine, uh, I, I can understand that. We did have an international um, competition. We had a bunch of judges that looked and they came to a view. It might be she's got a better idea of artistic views than they do, but I don't think so. She says it's not very Jewish. It's not sufficiently Jewish. Well, I'm not in a position to do that. I can only listen to the chief rabbi. Chief rabbi is happy with the design. That's, that's kind of good for me. 
And that money would not be there for, um, for anything else than, uh, than that we're going to be raising uh, money for it. We have generously um, and persistently uh, funded um, Holocaust education in this country and Holocaust remembrance. All the major Holocaust uh, organisations are in favour of it. So, but people are entitled uh, to a view. And I'm pretty determined that um, it's going to be truthful. And if you for, if just forgive me if I just say, say this. To me, I had a couple of visits last year that uh, there's kind of, um, kind of encompassed it for me. And, uh, you know, like uh, my, uh, my route into London on the rail is, is from Shenfield down to Liverpool Street. Liverpool Street was that great monument to the, uh, uh, the kinder transport, that lovely uh, uh, little boy and little girl. Um, uh, it's a long way from uh, Liverpool Street uh, to Minsk. Uh, in Belarus, and uh, I was there just before <coughs> the turn of the year, and uh, went to a place called Malitaskanet, which was a murder site, major murder site. And most of the parents of the children who went on the um, on the Kinder transport, either from Austria or from Czechoslovakia or from Hungary, died there and I laid a wreath in their memory. And we kind of forget the reason it's the kind of transport is we wouldn't let the parents in. So I want it to be truthful. I want us to talk truthfully about the white paper, why we wouldn't let numbers into, uh, into what was then Palestine. I want people to understand that. And the second, uh, I went on the um, Walk of the Living last year, and I uh, went with, uh, with Ivor Pearl, who I suspect a number of you know, Act. He's, a, he's a cheeky guy. He's a very funny man. He's a very full of irony and, uh, and great wit. And they pulled my leg enormously uh, on the journey. And uh, we ended up in Auschwitz. And uh, I'm on the council for Auschwitz, so I go there quite a bit. And I can't remember now, just talking about it, whether Ivor had been to Auschwitz twice or, or this was his third visit. <coughs> but his first visit was as a young kid, when he was on the separation ramp. And obviously it was a very emotional experience for him. And uh, I'm started chatting to him and he said, you know, you don't get it, Eric. So I said, what? He said, and it was a bright, sunny day, very hot day in May. And he said, uh, this is what it was like. This is what the weather was like when I came to Auschwitz for the first time. And, you know, we tend, to see those death camps in black and white terms. We see the Nazis as dark, and all of the, but, the, but the Holocaust happened in bright daylight. And it was committed not by monsters, but by ordinary people who had families, who went home, who found it acceptable to kill vast numbers of people and to lead a normal life. You know, you go, my um, American uh, opposite number introduced me to a, a guy who did the prosecution at Nuremberg um, for the Auschwitz group. And uh, they charged 26 of them. They put 26 of them on trial. And the reason they, put to, they did 26 is they didn't have 27 chairs. And that was the nature of, uh, of the justice. Most people went back to, uh, to directing traffic, uh, to teaching in kindergarten, to leading a kind of normal life. Most of them were pretty highly educated people. So we need to understand that, that the, that the Holocaust happened in daylight by ordinary people, and that's what we need to address. Yeah. Sorry, that went No, no, um, it's a, I, I was lucky enough to go to March of Living a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's a celebration, it's an extraordinary event. Uh, it, it's. Uh, something I would heartily recommend. Um, I'm going to have to fast forward through a, another dozen questions because I was very strictly told quarter past. So I'm going to ask one question on education um, and then we, we should round up. Um, faith schools have come under attack in recent years of, in terms of segregation, um, lack of integration, etc. Um, where do you stand on that? How, how do you counter that argument? I love faith schools. I mean, people, 
if it's like, it's like saying, you know, you know, if you're Jewish, your faith is an enormous part of what makes you tick. If you're Christian, your faith is an enormous part of what you tick. And to kind of remove that, as they, kind of, as they do sort of in France, of having this great system where uh, religion um, is banished seems to me to be utterly wrong. I think our, our different communities and our different faiths make this country a stronger, more enduring place. In terms of the, the, it being a sector who, that's under financial challenges more so year, year on year, do, do, you, do you feel the government unfairly t like twists, uh, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, gives more financial challenges than it should do in terms of the faith school sector? Uh, all governments are uh, excellent. All governments get in the way of all kinds of things and they, they restrict money and they put down all kinds of things. But, but by and large, I think... Um, uh, McGregor of Bayer, no uh, reference at all to who's talking. I think that's the video we're about to watch. Oh, okay, that's very nice. Thank you very much. I thought suddenly I have become more spiritual than I thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think Dan's trying to hint that we need to get off stage. Yeah. <laughs> Good night and thank you. <laughs> all right. <laughs>